Good morning, everyone. Greetings. Thank you so much for joining us this morning to celebrate Canada Public Health Week. Um, and from out here on the wet West Coast, I just want to uh, say a huge thank you to Canadian Public Health Association for helping to spearhead this national discourse and to support the kind of um, action and information sharing and knowledge mobilization that we want to see in public health across Canada. So let me begin by introducing myself. My name is Shannon Turner. I'm the Executive Director of the Public Health Association of BC, and it is our privilege to host today's webinar as part of this ongoing celebration. My pronouns are she, her, and elle, and I am coming to you from the traditional territory of the Lekwungen-speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. I come to you with uh, significant and profound gratitude for the privilege of living and working in this beautiful space. And I also uh, just want to share that uh, today's conversation raises the stakes for us all in terms of where we live and the value of our planet and how we need to work hard to protect her. So during our conference on planetary health, we had a scientific program committee that was um, both esteemed and profoundly active. We had Dr. Margot Parks and Dr. Trevor Hancock as our scientific co-chairs. The conference was uh, had many, many moments, which were really, we kind of called them peak moments. And one of them had to do with um, Dr. Takaro's lecture. Now, um, this lecture was part of a series that we've, um, created to acknowledge the contribution and work of Dr. Trevor Hancock. And many of you will know him as the father of the Green Party of Canada, the father of the Healthy Cities, Healthy Communities Movement, um, the founder of the Canadian Association for Physicians for the Environment, amidst other uh, networking coalition building activities that he spent his life pursuing. But at the forefront, he is, uh, was the lead author on a, a position paper for the Canadian Journal of Public Health on the environment and on the environmental determinants of health. And so PHABC was determined to find a way to recognize his legacy. And so we have named a lecture at our conference, the Dr. Hancock Lecture. And uh, he uh, reflected very deeply on who he wanted to give that lecture. And his decision was that he wanted Tim Takaro, Dr. Tim Takaro, to be um, his inaugural uh, speaker. And so, Tim, a little bit about Tim Takaro. And um, really, really grateful to Tim for giving this um, talk again to a wider national audience. Um, it has had a lot of interest and we think may form the basis of some important uh, documentation and legal argument going forward. So uh, Dr. Takaro trained in occupational environmental medicine, uh, public health and toxicology at Yale, the University of North Carolina, and the University of Washington. His research is primarily about the links between human exposures and disease and determining effective public health-based preventive solutions. But we know him as a tree climber and a tree sitter. And Dr. Takaro, in opposition to the Trans Mountain Pipeline, took residence in a tree with a group of activists and lived in the tree, uh, trying to call attention to the importance, the critical importance of preserving the natural world and protecting the environment. And he literally put his money where his mouth is. And he'll talk to you about the support he's had from his community and what it meant to him to undertake that work. But in fact, he was arrested and he went to jail. And he went to jail as a matter of conscience and as a matter of public um, service. And so in Dr. Hancock's decision to choose Dr. Takaro, I know it was based on his profound regard and love for what Tim did and who he is. So without further ado, it's my great privilege to introduce to you an extraordinary gentleman, Dr. Tim Takaro. Over to you, Tim. And I think we'll need to screen. Thank you so much, Shannon, and uh, good day, everyone. Uh, it's certainly an honor uh, to have given the 2022 Trevor Hancock Lecture for uh, Public Health Association of BC. Uh, I would first like to recognize the steadfast commitment of my 
Dean Tanya Bubala and my faculty colleagues who have built a marvelous place to contribute to public health in the Faculty of Health Sciences at SFU. And to colleagues, uh, family and friends uh, who stuck with me uh, through thick and thin in my most recent journey. And finally, uh, thanks to colleagues, um, Drs. Kate Kempton and Jeremy Snyder uh, for their important uh, contributions to my thoughts here today. I'm not getting a change. The first peoples on this land made a contract with the salmon. They would care for the streams, rivers, oceans, trees, and all those things that connect, show gratitude and humility in the face of the abundance all around them. And in return, the salmon would allow themselves to be fished at the same time every year. The heads and bones are ceremoniously returned to the waters and thanks. It is a reciprocal relationship. Their technology of fish wares and traps would have permitted them to take many more fish with each run, but they did not. In 175 years, the settlers have nearly wiped out the salmon. We have so much to learn. We are at a crossroads. Our laws governing the resource extraction economy not only no longer protect public health, but they facilitate our demise. The law that sent me to jail for protesting a pipeline that will worsen mortality and morbidity from climate change, if it is ever used, is representative of this colonial and outdated aspect of our laws. The injunction protecting the Trans Mountain Pipeline Expansion Project is only a recent example of how BC's extractive industries have weaponized our court system for their profit. These laws must be challenged and changed if we are to sustain ourselves and future generations in this incredibly beautiful land. Nonviolent civil disobedience is one way but it is not the only way. This is an outline of what I will cover over the next 50 minutes. First, we will uh, examine what our obligations are as public health in a climate emergency. <clears throat> then we will explore an ethics framework for uh, climate action in public health, and then examine some legal tools available uh, to force more timely action on climate. And finally, uh, we can discuss what role nonviolent civil disobedience might play in the next few years. <clears throat> we know this material. The anti-science wave that is engulfing parts of society is drowning us. This wave is of course driven by fear, fear of the unknown, which is terrifying enough, and uh, fear of the known, which is very terrifying. Building and rebuilding trust in evidence is our job number one as public health educators. Are we up to this task? I believe we are. Survival of the species depends upon it. Others are addressing uh, the policy levers that will increase adaptive capacity and reduce demand uh, for fossil fuels. The tough nut for Canada is our fossil energy addiction. And that is what I'm going to focus on today. Good progress is being made in electrification for Canadian transportation and utilities. And government is incentivizing emission cuts in other sectors. But oil and gas is projected to continue to increase its emissions well past 2030. Industry would like our focus to be only on demand, the demand side, but cuts in both supply and demand are required. We know where we need to go. We just need the political will to get there. The IPCC 
in their sixth assessment, examined this challenge in the context of our sustainable development goals. This figure is from last month's synthesis report showing the path forward and the process of implementing greenhouse gas mitigation and adaptation measures to support sustainable development. We are at a crossroads. We can take dramatic action now and follow the green path to achieve the 1.5 degree Celsius goal with societal choices supporting higher climate resilient development, or we can stay on the current red path resulting in business as usual and miss our sustainable development goals. Do we have the political will to mobilize society to protect future generations? UN Secretary Guterres points out that we are on a pathway to global warming of more than double the 1.5 degree C limit in Paris. Some government and business leaders are saying one thing but doing another. Simply put, they are lying. And the result will be catastrophic. This is a climate emergency. He goes on to say, that investing in new fossil fuels infrastructure is moral and economic madness. In this vein, I will focus on the madness part, the moral madness. Greed that begets profit for shareholders drives our deadly race to produce more oil and gas. A society and economic system addicted to fossil energy. The notion of ethical oil emerging from dialogue about global power struggles today is the ultimate in corporate greenwash. We can no longer act like a superior species, like the earth is only ours and we deserve to dominate her and consume as if the future doesn't matter. The philosophy of Cartesian dualism, humans above all other creatures, that has guided our economy since the 14th century is a death sentence. People knew this millennia ago and learned to live with humility and gratitude for the gifts of Mother Earth. We must recapitulate that in our lives today and teach it. This relearning of sustainable reciprocal relationships needs to sweep through the tables of power, our boards of governors, our legislatures, councils, and corporate boards, so that the future generations are put ahead of today's profits. <clears throat> Situations arise where health professionals have a moral obligation, a duty of care or necessity to respond to health injustices, including using civil disobedience as a last resort. Today, we see that action on climate change is required to protect public health, that Canada has largely stalled out on reducing its greenhouse gases, despite this action imperative. And the municipalities and nations across the globe, including ours, have declared climate emergencies. But emissions are not falling fast enough to meet the goals we promised to meet in Paris in 2015. Climate change impacts are the greatest injustice of the modern era because those with the smallest contribution to the problem face the greatest, greatest threats from these impacts. <clears throat> the road out of this morass can be daunting, but we have guides from our ancestors. Indeed, we stand on the shoulders of giants in previous movements for justice. And as Martin Luther King noted, we must walk on in the days ahead with an audacious faith in the future. Or as a former uh, PHABC president, Paola Ardias reminds us, we must engage in critical hope, a hope that embraces complexity, leads with purpose and cultivates transformative social change. So there are a few ways to move so here are a few ways to move against the massive inertia of our fossil fueled past with bold law and policy for the future. 
that our children's children may one day thank us for. Here's my list for today. And unfortunately, there's not enough time to go into the details on all of these. That would require a workshop for each one, but good information is available online for the ones I will only mention today. And we can get into these further in the discussion period, perhaps. <clears throat> First, we can legally compel industries to account for the cost of operations to the planet and future generations. We can build on the Dutch success in their Supreme Court. We can use carbon tax, including social cost of carbon, <clears throat> which includes the cost to the health system and future generations. There is a Sue Big Oil campaign that began in British Columbia uh, that focuses on these costs. And at the end of last year, Canada's Competition Bureau said they will hear a $10 million complaint from the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment and Canadian Association of Nurses for the Environment against the Canadian Gas Association for greenwashing in their advertising. This cannot come uh, any too soon. Uh, that advertising campaign is um, spending millions. We can advance stronger fossil emission reduction legislation. The current Federal Climate Action Plan and Clean BC does not adequately address fossil energy. And one example of such legislation is uh, Peter Julian's uh, M1 uh, on the Green New Deal in Parliament. <clears throat> we can defend future generations using human rights tribunals. The Filipino Human Rights Tribunal determined in 2019 that dozens of fossil energy companies, including all the majors, quote, have a clear moral responsibility for causing climate change, end quote. They were referring to the death and destruction from Typhoon Haiyan. <clears throat> they also noted that, quote, have been clearly proved to have been engaged in acts of obstruction and willful obfuscation, end quote, about the science of climate change and should be criminally charged. Finally, the fossil fuel uh, non-proliferation treaty uh, had major play at COP27 in Egypt, <clears throat> and it's been signed by over 70 municipalities, including 10 in British Columbia, and several countries, including the entire EU and the Vatican. <clears throat> we should follow the money. Canadian banks are major financers of fossil energy product, projects worldwide. For example, Royal Bank of Canada, um, paid out 9.2 billion last year for these energy projects. And <clears throat> as the Trans Mountain uh, expansion project cost rocket past $30 billion um, earlier this year, the vulnerability of the financing is ever more ap apparent. We can expose the insurers of fossil energy projects and the risks that they are taking on 18 of them have dropped uh, the Trudeau Trans Mountain Pipeline to date. We can block new fossil energy infrastructure with our bodies. And we could realize the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and its inherent protection of the planet. I will focus my remaining time on those last two points. <clears throat> Recall this realization by Lancet editors in 2015. The effects of climate change are being felt today and future projections represent an unacceptably high and potentially catastrophic risk to human health. And achieving this decarbonized global economy is not a technical or economic question, but a political one. I've been learning a lot about the legal system over the past several years, which has been both a good thing and a bad thing. Sitting in my jail cell reminded me of one of those early days as a first year resident in medicine, when I realized how much I still have to learn. But I've been inspired by many legal minds. Uh, recently, for example, the Good Law Project <clears throat> from the UK that 
has gathered hundreds of signatures from legal experts, including barristers, on the legality of the behavior by fossil fuel interests that extends and worsens the climate emergency. Several of these barristers have said they will not defend fossil energy companies any longer. This project reminds us that we're not taking, talking about natural phenomena here, but corporations with knowledge of harm who market their products anyway and walk away from the devastation with a shrug. We were just responding to demand. This is not our responsibility. In public health, we must respond to the ethical and legal challenges offered to us by the climate emergency. We each have our gifts. We are able to offer a spectrum of responses, but we must stand up for public health today and the children of tomorrow. I would add that particularly considering the anemic response of most governments and fossil energy industry to their commitments to reduce emissions since 2015, it is also an ethical question and one of fairness. It is outlined nicely in the Urgenda Foundation versus the State of Netherlands, in which the Dutch Supreme Court invoked the 1.5 degrees C limit as its benchmark for determining the scope of the rights to life and to family life. After years of appeals, the Supreme Court agreed in December of 2019. I'll quote here briefly from that decision. Climate science has arrived at the insight that a safe warming of the earth must not exceed 1.5 degrees C. And this means that the concentration of greenhouse gases mm -hmm. in the atmosphere must remain limited to a maximum of 430 ppm. Exceeding these concentrations would involve a serious degree of danger that the consequences referred to in 4.2, which includes the loss of human life, will materialize on a large scale. The Supreme Court finds that Article 2 and 8 of the European Convention on the Human Rights relating to the risk of climate change should be interpreted in such a way that these provisions oblige the contracting states to do their part to counter that danger, end quote. Having worked most of my career on the evidence base of health impacts of climate change within the legal boundaries of my profession, I have found it very refreshing to explore the ethical and legal aspects of the climate emergency. Here, I will briefly present a framework for your consideration. The Hippocratic Oath has undergone some changes since fifth century BCE, and many medical schools no longer have an oath per se like I did, but ethics are a pillar of medicine and public health. We each committed to protecting the health of people. Most of us swore to a duty of care, including to accept a share of the profession's responsibility to society in matters relating to the public health, health education, environmental protection, and legislation affecting the health and well being of the community. The general principles of the World Medical Association Code of Ethics uh, begins with what one would expect about good medical practice and professionalism, but it is followed immediately by this note quote that physicians also have a responsibility to contribute to the health and well being of the populations the physician serves and society as a whole, including future generations. End quote. Even the relatively conservative American Medical Association Code of Medical Ethics is explicit about the possible conflict between doctors' ethical duties and the law. Quote, ethical responsibilities usually exceed legal duties. When physicians believe a law violates ethical values or is unjust, they should work to change the law. In exceptional circumstances of unjust laws, ethical responsibilities should supersede legal duties, end quote. 
<clears throat> these are some key requirements for an effective response to the climate emergency as described uh, by Grasso. Uh, first, the uh, response must be widely shared uh, with agreement based upon principles of justice, equity, and fairness, as uh, was the case with civil rights. It will require collective action. Classic global problems uh, require global solutions with broad consensus. And they um, need to be self-enforcing. I have a question mark here because um, while there are currently no international bodies enforcing international climate agreements, theoretically the Security Council of the United Nations could um, enforce this uh, based on the threat to global security. This slide describes a pluralistic um, normative framework. Um, so distributed justice or fairness in allocation is key to the success in the climate crisis. And I, I think it is useful to consider these domains. I'll focus on mitigation because frankly, that's uh, where we have the most discordance in Canada. But many of these same uh, principles uh, apply to adaptation. There are two commonly held views on this framework for climate action. Uh, one is avoid regressive distributions, um, i.e. adding more cost to those who have already taken on uh, the largest harms. And two, um, from the time of Aristotle, uh, philosophy of equals being treated equally, but allowing for discrepancy in equality insofar as those with adequate means do not require the same support as those without such means. Within this framework, it is not fair for Canada or other wealthy nations to continue to increase our emissions. Regressive climate impacts are being seen today, of course, and this is a recurrent theme, um, which is playing out uh, in most recent floods in Pakistan, where famine uh, is happening in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, these are populations with very, very low carbon footprints and minimal contributions to the climate crisis, yet they are suffering the most. This is the hard part for wealthy nations. Uh, who are interested in protecting their comfort. Only the state can synthesize all the diverse duties and claims of individuals and provide the basis for solidarity, which is necessary to support the individual sacrifices required for mitigation and adaptation strategies. In a wealthy liberal democracy, citizens are expected to give up large quotas of their wealth for the sake of climate justice. This requires a balance between economic efficiency and environmental effectiveness and equilibrium. And ultimately that equilibrium can only be assured by fairness that is transparent to all parties. I want to focus a moment on uh, solidarity. Jennings has written on what solidarity means in the context of climate justice and notes that it is quote essential to counteract the centripetal forces that obscure our interdependence and lead us toward an illusion of self-sufficiency and invulnerability. This is one big thing that separates the climate justice movement from the truckers movement, for example, that paralyzed Ottawa and border commerce last year. Solidarity requires a positive identification with another and their position. It is driven by empathy and understanding. It is oriented towards improving or correcting past or present disadvantage or injustice, and it requires public action. So how does this relate to climate change mitigation? With equal allocation, we would all have the same carbon budget to spend annually. The primary question that the conference of the parties in uh, in Egypt grappled with 
uh, last November was how to correct these allocations to make them fair on a global scale, as Aristotle uh, brought to us. The late American philosopher John Rawls noted that grounds for consensus may differ, though parties can agree on the principles of justice. This principle is foundational to all the recent uh, COPs of the United Nations and uh, certainly was uh, part of the uh, call for action on loss and damage uh, at COP27. So to review this list so far, the potential actions uh, when laws harm public health are to compel industries to account for the costs in real terms, including uh, the cost to future generations, to health and social well-being, uh, to advance uh, stronger fossil emission reduction legislation, as I noted, to defend future generations using human rights tribunals, uh, to expand the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. We recall um, Eichmann's uh, defense from the Nuremberg trials that he was simply following the law and that his defense failed uh, there because the law cannot compel us to acts that go beyond conscience. The question of the defense of necessity then arises and the defense of necessity has been successfully use, used for climate action in the United States, though it has been uh, forcefully resisted by Canadian courts still. And this, uh, led us uh, to these last two points um, to block Canadian fossil energy infrastructure with our bodies, but also um, to realize the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So how did I get here? <clears throat> the um, Trans Mountain Pipeline was authorized by Canada the day following the passage of a parliamentary, parliamentary declaration of a national climate emergency. The approval process of the pipeline was flawed from the start with disregard for indigenous rights and health risks. The oil and gas sector is responsible for 50% of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions but climate change considerations were not allowed during the review of the pro project. We submitted two large reports outlining the need for an independent cumulative health impacts assessment and got, even got backing from the Health Officers Council of BC, but none of these efforts made any difference. And so I uh, reached the end of my rope. As noted previously, we stand on the shoulders of giants. There is no doubt about the profound injustice that the climate crisis embodies. Those who contributed least to the problem will suffer the most and they are really already are. While those most responsible are using their wealth to insulate themselves from the worst ravages of the crisis. This is contributing to further inequities. I grew up in North Carolina at a time when the first Woolworth sit-ins provided a kickstart to the racial justice movement. Martin Luther King, John Lewis, Rosa Parks, and many black leaders from the South inspired me eventually leading me to examine direct action as a last resort to protect the planet. Martin Luther King recognized that part of the power of nonviolent civil disobedience comes from accepting punishment for breaking the law, even when it is for a greater good. And this is one of his quotes from the Birmingham jail. In no sense do I advocate evading or defying the law. That would lead to anarchy. One who breaks an unjust law must do so openly, lovingly, and with a willingness to accept the penalty. I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment 
in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice, it's in reality expressing the highest respect for the law. I'm not alone. There are now many examples of direct action by other scientists, including cases led by Extinction Rebellion in the UK. The Lancet uh, published this useful set of uh, criteria for evaluating when direct action, uh, including nonviolent civil disobedience, is justified. And I would suggest to you that <clears throat> in the case of the Trans Mountain Expansion Project uh, resistance, these have all been met. And I would be happy to. Uh, to discuss this further at the end. Finally, nonviolent civil disobedience is effective. <clears throat> um, as noted, the confrontational tactics of direct action have become more common. And here are some reasons uh, beyond our frustrations with industry um, uh, successfully weaponizing the courts. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change concludes with high confidence that collective action connected to social movements plays a substantial role in pressuring governments to create new laws and policy for climate emissions. And the meta-analysis um, uh, of social movements contesting fossil energy show that um, direct action contributes to success over and above other tactics, um, the petitions, uh, the work with lawmakers um, <clears throat> and marches. <clears throat> so how did I get here? We um, established a movement in British Columbia to stop the pipeline. We built a coalition with indigenous allies. We brought in diverse community groups. We continued to blockade for 16 months. This is um, our most luxurious treehouse on the left there. But uh, we had um, many other uh, less luxurious spots, including hammocks, where uh, you'll see on the right um, uh, one of our uh, activists spent nine days in the hammock. Um, he's uh, 72 years old. <clears throat> we got support from everywhere we could. Uh, this is my family out on the streets. The hummingbirds uh, came to our support by nesting on the pipeline route and um, allowing themselves to uh, block the construction for four months uh, because they are protected by law. <clears throat> and um, we had support from uh, others, um, including um, the folks there uh, whose vehicle lost their wheels uh, right in the gate uh, crossing for a Trans Mountain facility. So I don't know how that happened. We connected with other blockades. This is uh, the Tiny House Warriors in uh, Blue River, British Columbia. <clears throat> and we had fun. Uh, the T-Rex became a symbol of our work. And here you can see T-Rex uh, stopping work uh, at, uh, in Burnaby. And uh, this is a young, um, activist uh, Robin's depiction of um, Tim talking to salmon um, in, the, in the trees. Eventually, some of us were arrested and a few of us went to jail. Um, this is uh, Catherine Hemling who spent her 80th birthday in jail. And that's me being uh, marched off. Uh, this is me being extracted from the tree with the uh, so-called community industry uh, response group, um, a militarized branch of the RCMP um, that um, came uh, in this cherry picker, heavily armed 
uh, to remove me from the trees and arrest me. And eventually, um, we all went to jail. And this, this is the Burnett River Six um, uh, that uh, spent quite a bit of time camping for in the trees and uh, all served time. <clears throat> Except for the first week when my rights were abused uh, in, in one of the most dehumanizing experiences of my life, uh, jail was generally a good experience, uh, definitely worth the effort and pain for me, and hopefully um, also worth it for my family, friends, and faculty. Uh, for one thing, I'm no longer afraid of prison. This is a uh, on, day on my release, uh, Independence Day. Um, as uh, Shannon mentioned, I uh, did uh, my early career in the United States. <clears throat> so Independence Day was a special meaning this year. My final points uh, are going to be on indigenous law, for which I'm very grateful for Dr. Kate Kempton's work uh, in this area. The government recognizes that indigenous self-government and laws are critical to Canada's future and that these indigenous perspectives and rights must be incorporated in all aspects of this relationship. Can this future show us a way out of our moral quandary? <clears throat> but how does the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and Indigenous law guide us in our work to protect the planet? Recall that we are not talking about technical or economic barriers to the solutions required to steer ourselves away from the abyss of climate disaster. We have the wealth and the wisdom. To date, we have lacked the political will and leadership required. I agree with Shannon Waters, Kate Kempton, and others that a real commitment to Indigenous rights and laws could lead us out of our moral quandary and the denial we have about the climate emergency. To do this, we will have to step beyond current interpretation of colonial laws that puts protecting industry and profits before protecting people and the planet. As noted in my land acknowledgement, <clears throat> indigenous peoples have been living on these lands in sustainable societies since time out of mind. And as my indigenous colleague Shannon Waters notes, the ecosystem is our health system. We were recently reminded of this by research done through the UN's Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services that was first released in November of 2019 and reiterated at the Montreal COP last year on biodiversity. Some facts from this report uh, nature is generally declining less rapidly in indigenous people's lands than in other lands. And critical to my next comments, um, <clears throat> governance, including customary institutions and management systems and co-management regimes that involve indigenous peoples and local communities can be an effective way to safeguard nature. <clears throat> there is conflict between colonial laws and planetary health. Colonial laws are linear, dominance-based, people at the top and apart from the earth, designed to exploit and conquer the earth. Uh, in other words, the Cartesian dualism I referred to previously. <clears throat> colonial laws are fragmented, piecemeal, snapshots of places and people and things, but also of time making it harder to challenge authority. They are individualist and rights-based, incrementalist. They preserve the status quo with its order and stability. This is not the urgency required of our times. Finally, colonial laws are reactive and not proactive. So our climate preparedness and adaptation strategies are simply uh, preparing for the impacts of climate change and not trying to prevent them. There are many opportunities in indigenous laws. 
starting with the certainty and serenity of the inevitable. Indigenous laws relies upon relationships and responsibility. They value the collective and is, are based on community. The laws are circular and holistic in nature. It is cumulative and timeless. Adaptive and the changes are dictated by feedback from the planet and by being responsible for future generations. And perhaps most importantly, they are sustainable. Colonial laws can and should be guided and applied in accordance with indigenous legal principles. Our current trajectory is towards the sixth mass extinction. <clears throat> this phase of human evolution uh, that we're in has to come to an end one way or another. Evolution is required. Post-colonialism as informed by indigenous legal orders, blending, splicing, merging of cultures, laws, and the communities that restore and protect the planet. This evolution must be led by choice rather than by molecular chance or whatever emerges out of the primordial ooze in a lightning storm. BC's Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People was passed uh, by the legislature in November of 2019, and it establishes the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People as a framework uh, for the province's uh, reconciliation work. It is demanded, in fact, by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. And uh, now we have to engage in the work of enabling legislation, which is still to be written. <clears throat> I'll quickly review some of the fundamentals of the act in my closing minutes. Section three states that in consultation and cooperation with the indigenous peoples in British Columbia, the government must take all measures necessary to ensure the laws of British Columbia are consistent with the declaration. Right now we're working on uh, aligning our Water Act with the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And that would, um, of course, include the protection of watersheds and source water, um, which would be a major step forward uh, in water protection. Each agent of the law can apply it following Indigenous legal principles. If so applied, healing occurs. If applied persistently, more healing will occur. And there is no failure unless and until one gives up. So don't give up. <clears throat> the DRIPA rights are consistent with reduced emissions and nature protection. Indigenous peoples and individuals have the right not to be subjected to forced assimilation or destruction of their culture. And states shall provide effective mechanisms for prevention of and redress for any action which has the aim or effect of depriving them of their integrity as distinct peoples or of their culture, cultural values, or ethnic identities. And finally, any action which has the aim or effect of dispossessing them of their lands, territories, or resources. <clears throat> Dripper rights are consistent with reduced emissions because in Article 18, states shall consult and cooperate in good faith with the indigenous peoples concerned through their own representation the representative institutions in order to obtain their free prior and informed consent before adopting and implementing legislative or administrative measures that may affect them. And in Article 24, Indigenous peoples have the right to determine and develop priorities and strategies for exercising their right to development. In particular, 
Indigenous peoples have the right to be actively involved in developing and determining health, housing, and other economic and social programs, and as far as possible to administer such programs through their own institutions. Canada should meet its climate commitments made to the United Nations through the COP process, but it is not doing so. And I would put to you that consensus is not required. The former Minister uh, for Environment and Climate Change Canada, Catherine McKenna, said at COP27, and I'll quote here, you can't be a climate leader and invest in new fossil fuel projects. You can't use credits to meet emissions reduction goals. You can't reduce emissions intensity instead of absolute emissions reductions." End quote. Now she is no longer part of government. She escaped the ministry she led, a ministry that I would say has been captured like many government ministries by the extractive industries that run Canada. So we have to ask, in a climate emergency, is consensus required or even desired? As mentioned previously, the UN Security Council has the power to act unilaterally in the event of a, quote, threat to international peace and security, end quote, up to and including the use of force. The Health Act of British Columbia enables health officials to respond to protect the public from significant harm, up to and including the use of the courts and law enforcement, as we did with the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. When do we say it's time to use these tools before it's too late? We are in a pandemic of denial on the urgency of climate change. Compounding this fact is that we are living at a time when moral authority lies beyond the present day judicial system. The question a Western worldview asks is, can we do this? The question an enlightened indigenous worldview asks is, can we afford not to do this? Thank you for your attention and look forward to uh, any questions. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, I learned something new every time I hear this talk, and I've had some reflections, um, which I'd like to uh, start our question and answer with. I want to invite people to put their questions into the Q&A, um, and then we have them in, in, in right order. Um, and there's already a couple of great questions there. Um, but before we move into them, there's something that um, sort of unfolded in your talk for me. And I was reflecting back on Sage Lassert's presentation at the conference when she said and asked us to reflect on our family relations and our mothers and our grandmothers and talked about the fact that Earth is our first mother. And you said the law cannot compel us to go beyond conscience. And I was thinking about collective consciousness, but I was also thinking about the consciousness of species, whether they're animal species or floral species and what we are beginning to understand in terms of sentience, in terms of the way that floral, uh, you know, flora, trees, plants, um, nurture, uh, take care of each other and restore us. Um, and the fact that there are literally energy networks involved in uh, communication. And I was thinking about this energetic net, this living system of Mother Earth, and how we need to be conscious of that. And it is that consciousness connected to conscience and to connected to our awareness that enables us to act in a right way in terms of our lives and our relationship with nature. And I feel like the work that you are doing, connecting your moral compass 
to your choices and to your action in response to your awareness of the value of our environment, of our planet, of our earth. So all of these things are woven together for me. And um, I was very, very interested in your concepts of solidarity, not just solidarity with one another or with uh, populations around the earth that have different sense of equity and experience, but solidarity with nature. So for me, this talk, having heard it now, this is my third visit through this discourse. It becomes deeper and deeper to me what you are sharing. And uh, so I really value that. And I just wanted to share those reflections with everyone as I have, have been blessed to you know, partner with you on this dialogue. Um, I love the fact that you said the hummingbirds came. And in fact, that's a perfect response to an energetic call for protection, for affirmation, for co-creation and for new life. Um, and so I think when we connect with spirit, mind and body in the way that indigenous ways of knowing encourages us to do, we experience life differently. We experience connection differently. We experience our morality differently and it shifts the way we act. So consciousness and conscience are intimately connected. And that's what I observe in your life and in your work. So um, thanks for letting me share that with you and with everyone. And uh, we can go to some of the questions now. Um, I don't know if you have any response, Tim, um, before we do that, but. Well, uh, thanks, Shannon. Um, I absolutely agree that um, that connectedness is key to getting us out of um, our our current dilemma. And also, I think, are part of Indigenous law. Um, there is so much to explore um, in Indigenous law. Um, and it's a bit of a challenge because um, not much is written um, because Indigenous law is oral. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, this, that's, um, it's a, a wonderful um, commentary. Thank you. So we're going to move into the Q&A and then there's some in the chat. So I'll start with the questions in the Q&A. And the first question, which I love, and this actually came up in a prior conversation and I think is very helpful. What is your view on the use of civil disobedience by early career professionals, useful or harmful to the ability to have a positive impact in their field in the long term? Uh, this, this particular question uh, is really, vital in terms of the way we create support for folks who are, we used to say climbing the fence, um, but in this case, your case, it was climbing the tree. So Tim, to you. Yeah, it's an important um, uh, question. And I'm gonna just share my screen here uh, with another diagram um, <clears throat> because uh, we're all on a different uh, trajectory <clears throat> in terms of, uh, what we are able to do. And I certainly uh, was in a privileged position uh, when I took my action in the sense that, well, one, I had the support of my faculty and, and my dean. Um, and also I was at this stage in my career where um, I uh, was established enough so that um, I could honestly say that well, if there, the consequences are too bad and I lose, um, uh, you know, the tail end of my career, that is worth it. Um, so I, I do caution uh, young um, professionals on how far they can go. I think you definitely want to uh, have your eyes wide open and understand um, clearly what the consequences are. But um, in my case, you know, I have no criminal record. It was not a criminal offense. Um, it was violating an injunction um, and the contempt of court. And um, I'm okay with that. 
I, I um, feel that the court is um, behaving uh, in a retrograde fashion that the court, I mean, they told me that your environmental concerns are of no concern to this court. So I know what's right and wrong and that is wrong. So it was, it was okay for me. But this diagram help, is helpful because uh, we all have gifts to bring and uh, we also know what needs to be done. So uh, your personal um, approach then is what you're good at. Uh, you know that or um, your colleagues can tell you that. Um, the part that only you know is what feeds your soul, what uh, gives you joy, what uh, is worth it when uh, there will be consequences. So um, yeah, I urge you to think about this in the context of um, this diagram and uh, bring your gifts to the table, uh, take action because um, I think action is therapeutic. Uh, we're, we're in a dark place right now. Um, we're hell bent on destroying the planet. Um, and uh, our leaders are absolutely lost. So uh, it's, a, it's a dark time and we, we do need the hope that action brings. And I, I, I'm a firm believer that um, hope is the antidote to despair. So do take your action, but do it carefully. Thank you, Tim. I really appreciate that. I know we are just a little past time. We've asked CPHA for an extra five minutes, um, and I'm assuming that's going to be granted. Um, but if we do all get cut off, I want to say thank you all so much for showing up today. This is all part of the work we need to do to bring our agenda more forward in this country and to create consciousness across our um, various um, territories. Um, there's a question here from Robert Rattle. Thanks for the presentation. Given the news out of BC, what's your opinion on legislation to prohibit politicians who've served or do serve on corporate boards from holding office and prohibiting them from serving on corporate boards, senior management after departing politics? We have a couple of recent examples, the head of uh, BC Housing that moved over to uh, a massive um, you know, housing development uh, around the Kitts Beach area. And then um, Premier Horgan uh, has joined the board of a coal business, and I checked it out, and it's apparently for making steel. Um, thoughts, Tim? Well, um, you know, the interests of uh, extractive industries are uh, quite apparent. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, in a sense, that is a good thing that, that it, nobody questions whether or not uh, uh, Tech Comenco is extracting coal and contributing to um, climate emergency. But the consequences are like, oh, well, there's nothing we can do about it. And that's the part that is quite annoying. So um, more than annoying, uh, I, I think actually it's criminal. And um, <clears throat> so, you know, John Horgan is justifying this by saying, uh, you know, I have to take care of my family. And I'm sorry, that is not a justification. Um, we have to take care of the world family. And that requires an immediate reduction in um, burning of fossil fuels. And it doesn't matter whether that's um, because you're burning coal for uh, making steel or burning coal for making energy. We should not be burning coal anymore. And certainly we should not be expanding this industry. So the, <clears throat> the role for public health in, in this legislation is, I think, as, a, as I mentioned earlier, that um, these are legislation is absolutely one of the ways that we should try to bring about change. It's not all about civil disobedience. Um, we must use the levers of power that we have um, through legislative process as well. Um, our frustration was that the legislative process failed us and is continuing 
to fail us in the courts um, because our judges are protecting industry instead of protecting future generations. So yeah, I think there is certainly room for uh, public health um, in this arena. And um, there is also an accountability that um, uh, our leaders have to face uh, as they go through these revolving doors. Thank you so much, Tim. A couple of things I want to follow up with before we close the session is that the Public Health Association of BC is an active partner in a number of coalitions focusing on sustainability and addressing planetary health and climate um, resilience. And um, we're currently engaged in um, uh, some granting work with, with uh, municipalities around climate uh, resilience. Um, we participated with West Coast Law and Gen Squeeze in a pollution pricing case that went to the Supreme Court, and we were successful with that. Um, so we are very active in this space in terms of our communications channels, our advocacy efforts, our position papers outlawing rodenticide, for example. Um, and I thought that was on mute, apologies, folks. <laughs> And anyway, so uh, I want you to know that there are ways that public health associations and public health advocates can be involved in um, policy setting, in systems change, uh, and in advocacy, it, all ways which are within the, within the law. And I also want to acknowledge that there are souls who are called to do the kind of work that Tim has done, and they require a lot of support. And so it's really vital as we look at how to use law and how to push law that we uh, examine legal frameworks and contest them. The United Nations, WHO, we've heard a lot about how serious this threat is and what it means for social justice, for equity, addressing um, uh, the consequences for future generations and our obligation as citizens to preserve the uh, viable future of humanity and other species. So in, in the face of that, we're pretty assertive about the work we're undertaking. And Tim and I have been to the Ministry of Environment about health impact assessments, and we will continue to do that work. So if you're interested, join your local public health association, get them involved, uh, be part of uh, policy advocacy research and uh, strengthen our response to these challenges. I was very concerned that the Green New Deal, which Tim referenced in his talk, has now been shifted um, as a result of negotiations with the fossil fuel industry. So I, um, I think there's a lot of work ahead for us and uh, really appreciate you coming and listening. And we, th we believe that this conversation about legal frameworks and perspectives is a very powerful mechanism we will be exploring with Dr. Takaro. So thank you one and all. Thank you so much, Tim. And uh, there's more to do. God bless everybody. Have a great day. <laughs>